Today, I'm gonna to teach you what I know about radiant heat versus convective heat. Welcome to the Smoker Builder Podcast. Hey, I'm Frank Cox. I'm the barbecue pit engineer. And for the last 30 something years, I was a refrigeration uh, guy. I had a commercial refrigeration company and I made my living uh, making temperature happen in different places by moving all kinds of different fluid, air, refrigerant, water, all kinds of stuff like that. But I've also been building smokers and designing them using my skill set since about, I don't know, 2007. So I figure that I have a thing or two, like some opinions on uh, what I think happens with radiant heat versus uh, convective heat. Um, as most of you probably know, but those that don't know, I make the uh, offset smoker for Mad Scientist Barbecue, Jeremy Yoder. I used to make the Legend offsets, but then I got so busy with Jeremy that I had to quit making the octagons and start making the round ones. I went down with uh, Jeremy to my buddy Al Fragoni's class. And Al Fragoni, if you don't know who he is, Al Fragoni uh, is from Argentina. I think he basically walks on water when it comes to cooking. So... Uh, especially open fire, radiant heat, stuff like that. You see, if you don't follow him, you totally should. I learned something hanging out down there with Al Fragoni that I have yet to make a podcast about, and that's what I decided to talk about. Those of you that don't know who Mad Scientist Barbecue is, Jeremy has his channel, Mad Scientist Barbecue, and he's taught a lot, a lot, a lot of people how to do things barbecue. His channel's phenomenal. You should totally go watch it. But having those two guys sitting there teaching this class at Al Fragoni's place, cooking open fire, cooking offset smokers on the solution offset, cooking with a direct heat cooker. I also sell the smoke slinger uh, direct heat cookers. And having those two guys in the same place at the same time doing two different kinds of barbecue and me with no pressure on me to actually do the cooking, I was able to make some very simple observations that were I don't know, I, I have a deep respect for physicists and it's in physics, it's like, isn't it obvious? That's, that's how you know that you're onto something because it should be so simple that it's ob it should have been obvious, right? So kind of get right down into it. So with offset smokers, which is about 99% of what I talk about on this channel is offset smokers, reverse flow smokers, cabinet smokers of different kinds, even uh, drum smokers like our Super 55 drum smoker, everything that we cook with, the primary source of cooking the food is, is airflow, which is convective heat. And there is some radiant heat that happens in that cooker, but the, the thing that we focus the most on is, is getting our airflow right, maintaining temperature by the proper amount of airflow combined with the right size fire, big enough coal bed, things like that so that we can keep this cooker right here behind me, even temperatures all the way across it. Now with open fire cooking, it's a completely different scenario. And I'll tell you the story of, of what happened and why it dawned on me. Like I've seen it before, I never thought about it, but cooking with Al, I've, I've got a little cooker here. I'm not gonna move my phone because I, I, I'll tip it. It's leaned on a ladder right now. I don't have a fancy tripod, but there's a cooker right here next to me that is, I call a schwanker. It's basically a hanging grate that swings. That's what it means in German is swinging grate over a direct coal fired pan, basically for me to have a fire going. With that kind of cooking, we cook direct. Uh, Al has these cookers that look like wagon wheels and they're really this big trapeze act over the top of it and stuff like that. And he was teaching us how to cook a whole hog open fire on that thing. And if you go and check out his channel, you'll see some videos where he's got this like cage that he sandwiches this pig inside of or whatever he's cooking. And he, he like squeezes it between two great grids or grates. And then that thing literally props like this. It's like a slot it falls down in and it's, it's like slotted like that. And when I was standing there in, at his place in Texas, the wind was blowing. It's almost like the kind of wind where it feels good it's it, but it's like a straight, almost like a sheer wind that just like burns your face after about eight hours of standing in it. It was like that. It was a very nice day, but a steady, consistent, straight horizontal wind that just did not go away. 
and the wind was blowing this, or let's say the wind was blowing this way because I'm right-handed. Wind was blowing this way, and he, for some reason, put that pig on the upwind side of the cooker. So cooker here, wind blowing that way, the pig, he put it right here. And I'm sitting there scratching my head. I'm trying to figure out, like, why did he do that? And I didn't, I didn't want to sound stupid, so I didn't ask, you know, because sometimes you're sitting in a class full of people and you just don't want to be the guy to say it. Um, so I waited just to see if somebody else was going to bring it up because I'm sitting here thinking, like, the wind's blowing away from the pig towards the fire. And how's this pig going to cook? Well, he built his fire all the way upwind, like on that side completely away from the pig, not under the pig, away from the pig. So pig here, fire here, and the wind blowing that way. And so what happened was the wind blows on the pig's back and blows the heat away in my mind. Anyway, he lit the fire, got her going, feeling his hand underneath the pig, you know, and uh, rubbing it around. And I asked him, I was like, so what, shouldn't you have the pig on the other side? And he said, good question, no, you do not want the pig on the other side. He said, because what'll happen is with this style of cooking, we wanna warm the meat all the way through to the other side before we sear it. And the way we do that is radiant heat. All of our heat is radiant heat off the coal bed. And I was looking at it and I was like, oh, <laughs> radiant heat is omnidirectional. It doesn't care. It doesn't depend on air to move the radiant heat around. It radiates. So at, at that moment in time, I start trying to put this all together in my, in my simple Missouri mind here. And, and so I, I put my hand under the pig and he said, what you should have between the coals up against the pig, like about two inches off the inside of that pig's belly facing the coals, you should hold your hand and, and like slowly move it from bottom to top and then back down you should move your hand about, and you should have about 12 seconds of comfort for your hand to sit there. It should be like, move your hand, dummy, about 12 seconds in. And that's what they consider low and slow. And I'll be darned if I didn't have exactly 12 seconds from the size of the fire that he built with the coal bed, where he put the fire and where the pig was and the wind blowing, 12 seconds, no problem. And, and so at that moment, I was like, okay, I need to pay attention here because like this is really going to change the way I look at heat in an offset smoker. Radi rule number one, radiant heat is omnidirectional. It doesn't care. You reflect radiant heat. So we go over and we cook on this other thing from Tagwood. If you ever looked at a cooker by a company called Tagwood, um, it looks like a stainless steel Santa Maria grill. Honestly, from a pit builder's perspective, um, they're really nice, but they're thinner material. But that kind of doesn't matter because they're filled full of uh, fire brick. When I was down there, his boy um, was was showing me, his oldest son there was cooking with us. And 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 he was I was just like, what do you think about fire brick? And and he's like, fire brick is important for this because it the, the heat reflects off that fire brick. It's not intended necessarily to be insulation. It's intended to reflect the heat up at whatever they're cooking. Thing number two, fire brick reflects. It doesn't insulate, right? So I guess it does insulate, but I'm saying in this moment, it doesn't insulate for the intended uh, application of that stuff. So now let's get on over to the Jeremy Yoder side of this class. Jeremy was over there cooking on the solution offset in the same wind, mind you. And that wind was blowing, I mean straight at that firebox and that cooker did not care the solution offset could care less what the wind was doing it just cooked right and with that cooker our intention was to sweat heat out of the firebox have the vertical baffle plate in front of that now i cosmo uh there's been all kinds of vertical scoop baffles ever since the beginning of barbecue back in the early 90s when jambo started putting those in his pits who knows where he got it from? Um, my The only assumption that I have is that there was stories about big restaurants down there using these things called blocker logs on their cooking grates. They would put a log right in front of their brisket and use that as a shield to prevent the heat and the air from hitting the, the end of that brisket and just blistering the first one. So I think that's kind of maybe where it got started. 
but Jambo had a scoop that pointed up. And then I was having beers with Cosmo back in 2019 at a marketing conference and he pulled out the old napkin there and we started sketching around on stuff because he was telling me about the best pits he ever had made. And uh, that's where I learned about the scoop, or what I call a vertical baffle. Other people call the, the vertical scoop baffle. So I did a podcast. If you want to go back and, and hear my uh, version of that, kind of like I'm telling you here, when the, when the light bulb came on for Frank, go all the way back uh, probably four years ago, four or five years ago on my podcast stuff here or on the YouTube channel, and you'll see a talking head video of me driving around in the truck telling you about what kind of baffle plate you should use in an offset smoker. And uh, that's where I start talking about an open offset. That's what I called them at first because I didn't know the, the baffle plate name for it. But anyway, our intention with that plate is to get that superheated air mass that's coming directly out of the firebox that's just loaded down with fresh, brand new heat. We want to get that to go straight to the top get it completely away from that leading edge of whatever meat is there in an effort to make the entire cooking grate useful and or usable, let's say. Zero impact on the food. We don't burn it. We don't have any issues up by the firebox. And uh, so I, I was thinking through that, you know, and Jeremy and I had a few conversations and back and forth in a little bit. And then it dawned on me, I hate insulating fireboxes because from the early days, we talked about sweating heat. And whenever I had my Mac cooker, Mac was a reverse flow I built that has a double wall quarter inch plate, insulated firebox. And uh, I noticed that it loved to run 300. It was really difficult to get that pit down around 225. I had it just would, a candle would heat it. And uh, I noticed that if you ever had a buddy helping you run that cooker, and if he had to take the poker out and start whacking the coal bed and busting up the log, that cooker would slingshot and the heat would go way up. And that just increased all the surface area exposed to oxygen of the coal bed. And now we just superheated. You'll hear me talk about that in our, in our podcast here, several episodes. And so now we overfueled or we got too much BTUs going into this pit. And so at that, I started to kind of change my mind about insulated fireboxes after that because I had to run too clean of a fire. It's almost like running a pellet smoker or a charcoal smoker at that point because you don't, you don't really get like the flavor of hickory in your, in your, or whatever wood, cherry wood. You don't, you can't really pick it out. Like there's no noticeable uh, difference in the flavor that I can tell until you can, and this is air quotes here for the guys on the audio version, air quotes says a dirtier fire. That does not mean a dirty fire. It just means like get some blue smoke going instead of clear. When you start to get that blue smoke going, now we got flavor. But the problem is in order to do that, I had, to, I had this conflict here. I couldn't run a clean fire, number one. Number two, I had to get rid of some of that superheated air and an insulated firebox prevented that from happening. So, because you can touch the outside of the firebox, it protects your paint, blah, blah, blah. Now we got to limit how big our fire can get. And so we get a cleaner tasting food rather than a smoky, awesome richness, you know, food. Not soot, <laughs> but a good flavorful smoke in that food, you know. So I'm sitting here thinking about all of that. And it just, bing, the light bulb came on. Radiant heat cooks one way, convective heat cooks another way. So in an offset smoker, the most important uh, kind of heat, in my opinion, is going to be uh, convective heat, which means it's completely okay for your smoker to have leaky doors. You have permission now from me, okay? I'll give you permission because this is how I believe. Um, as far as my engineering and design and straight up refrigeration guy experience goes here, by the way, I also worked on commercial food equipment all them 30 years as well, my brother and I, and uh, every kind of commercial food equipment you can think of. So in that case, I feel like it's okay for me to tell you that it's okay for your doors to leak. It does not matter. Do not insulate your firebox if you want really good flavorful food, like you wanna taste the smoke. If you're coming from the pellet cooker world, don't worry about insulated fireboxes. It's overkill. 
And in my opinion, it's completely a waste of money on, on the material. You're doubling the cost of your firebox by the time you insulate it and all of that stuff, and you got 10 times as much welding. So um, unless you're in a situation where like you're near the Arctic Circle or it rains every day on your smoker, something like that, that's literally robbing the heat from your air mass, that's a situation where I would consider it. Um, but I would try to do something else in that case. I would build a building over it or something, you know, instead. Um, cause you don't want to get wet cooking on your cooker, you know? So that's kind of what I think there. Um, and then if it's that freaking cold outside, what are you doing running a cooker outside? You need to find something else to do. So anyway, uh, move South. That's what you do. So anyway, uh, yeah, I hope that was helpful. So just to kind of conclude this thing, radiant heat is, is best used for open fire cooking. And by the way, if you ever have a chance to take a class from Al Fragoni um, or Fuegos, Texas, or any of that stuff that he does, completely recommend it. You won't believe the food that you'll have. It's just simple, salt, pepper, heat, and uh, that's really it. No thermometers involved. Do not trim fat, do not trim membrane. You'll get a slap on the wrist, and uh, that's kind of how Al cooks. Um, however, you know, cooking on an offset smoker, or these big pits that we build and we design, that's why our fireboxes are so big is because it takes that much. My fireboxes will be 25% or larger of the cook chamber volume. So half of a 500 gallon tank is the minimum size for a thousand gallon offset, in my opinion. Um, that's 25%. Half of 500 is 25% of a thousand. So that being said, uh, don't scrimp on firebox size. Don't bother insulating. We want to get as much air through this pit and we want to take as much radiant heat out of that air mass as we possibly can so that we can get the best flavor for our barbecue. So anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed that uh, little talk there. Hope you learned something. If you did, uh, hit me in the comments. Um, if you think I'm wrong, I'm okay with that. Tell me in the comments too. And uh, by the way, I have uh, all kinds of sets of plans over on smokerplans.net. Uh, over 240 sets. And as, I, as I'm sitting here, uh, I'm getting ready to publish a 500 gallon with half of a 250 on it, which is the 25% rule again there, by the way. Uninsulated firebox. And uh, I think you'll enjoy that set of plans if you're looking to build something on a sled for a large catering operation or a smaller barbecue restaurant that's about the right size. So, or if you just want to show off and have a bigger pit than your buddy, that's a good one too. But anyway, 240 sets of plans over on smokerplans.net. And if you ain't got enough of this kind of stuff yet, content like this, go over to smokerbuilderu.com. That's smokerbuilder, the letter u.com. And uh, you can join our private behind the scenes community that is free to join um, we just don't let all the weirdos in there and it's not on Facebook. So we could do whatever we want in there. And then by the way, there's all kinds of online courses in there as well from fire management all the way through to barbecue pit engineering with Frank and stuff like that. So um, anyway, till next time, guys, I appreciate you. Keep your smoke thin and blue and we'll see you on the next episode. Cheers.